Hey community, in today's episode, Matt sits down with worship leader and songwriter Tim Hughes to talk about tons of different parts about being a worship leader, songwriting, worship itself. I love this interview and hope you do too. What's up, everybody, and welcome to this week's edition of Loop Live. My name is Matt McCoy. I'm the founder of loopcommunity.com and the host of the Loop Live show. Today, I have a very special guest. I've got Tim Hughes. He has written so many worship songs that have that worship leaders are singing in churches. Uh, some of the most well-known ones, I mean, he, if we go way back to Here I Am to Worship, which for sure that's a song that you have sung at your church, guarantee you if you're a worship leader. Here I Am to Worship or Happy Day. I remember playing Happy Day all the time at youth camps and uh, such great songs, great songwriter, anointed worship leader. And I'm just really excited to talk with him today. So what are we waiting for? Let's go ahead and bring in Tim Hughes. Tim, good to see you, mate. Hey, <laughs> great to see you too. Man, you know what? We actually, um, so we've actually met a few times a long time ago, though, when I was a very, very young worship leader. <laughs> and uh, yeah. I actually have a photo I want to show you today. Uh, let's bring up this photo. So, Tim, we, <laughs> this is a long wow. time ago. This is in 2003. We're in Cincinnati, sure. Ohio at Summer of Service wow. at the Vineyard Church there. Mm. And that's a church that I used to uh, work at, actually, as a worship leader. But I also attended this youth camp there that you came and led worship at once in the summer. Amazing. And uh, uh, but then all we so yeah we both look a little bit different since then. <laughs> I um, aged well. Yeah. Yes, you did. We um, Tim. We also met at a. I came out to Soul Survivor one time in like I think it was two thousand and five. And you yeah. probably don't remember, I mean, this at all. I mean, we had, Mike Pilavachi had invited me out because we had met at a yeah. vineyard church in Columbus. I was leading worship at the okay. vineyard in Columbus. And Mike was like, yeah. hey, you got to come out to this youth camp we're doing, uh, you know, this festival, come. And I hopped on a flight. I was like 18 years old, 19. And mm. I remember I had no idea what I was like getting myself into. And I remember like, they're like, here's your room. And it was like, a, we were, I was like sleeping in a barn. <laughs> it was like. Yeah. Literally, they had taken like these like, cow stalls. Say, you'd have been in a cow bed. shed. You'd have been in a cow shed. <laughs> yes, I was in the cow shed, and I'm like, "Where in the world am I?" Um, yeah. But we got to hang out there. I remember I had I got like yeah. to hang out with you at lunch one time and just yeah. ask you questions. Yeah, yeah. And I'm sure I asked you a lot of like goofy like questions that a young <laughs> worship leader, a little starstruck, probably would ask. Um, <laughs> but anyways, I say that all of that just to say that. You were very influential to me as a wow. worship leader when I was very, very young. And uh, mm -hmm. I remember when your album came out, the Here I Am to Worship album, I remember mm -hmm. literally writing out my own chord charts for all of those songs. I mean, that was in like 2001. Wow. And I played yeah. all those songs, like May the Words of My Mouth, Maker of All Things. Like, wow. I actually, I still listen. I have listened to that album a few times, even recently. And... Wow. Uh, so, man, but a lot has happened since then. And that's, I also mm -hmm. want to dig into that. Like, I want to hear about, like, your journey. So I have, like, so many questions mm -hmm. for you. Um, it's great, great to connect again. And thank you for sharing that. It's amazing. Uh, amazing, isn't it, how our lives kind of interconnect over the years. And, yeah, beautiful to hear. I know. I, actually, another memory just popped in my head where I remember you were leading worship at the Vineyard in Evanston in Chicago. Yeah. Um, and guys. Nicholson. Yes. And some worship leaders, I was living in Indiana at the time, and some worship leaders in the area were like, hey, Tim Hughes is leading worship tonight in Evanston. We just heard about it. Let's go. And so we got in the car and drove over. And, wow. Uh, but man. anyway, so how, can you tell us just, how did you even start leading worship? And who inspired you or who taught you? Like, how did that even begin? Yeah, so I um, I think my journey was hugely impacted with this ministry of Soul Survivor. A guy called yeah. Mike Pilavachi, and you mentioned him. And I, uh, my, my dad was a pastor, so I grew up in the church. But I remember going to this kind of youth festival, <clears throat> and what struck me was the worship, the expression of musical sung worship. And I, I remember even at a young age just being so struck by all of these people not just singing about God, but singing to God, it was like a two-way relational interaction. And I remember being filled with the Holy Spirit and just, I came away with a deep love for Jesus. And uh, I, I wanted to find a way to keep that sense of encounter and engagement. So I began to learn the guitar 
And I just spent hours in my room learning all these songs, Matt Redman, Delirious, guy called Graham Kendrick, all the vineyard, touching the father's heart songs. And I just spent hours and hours and hours worshipping away. And, and a guy called Mike Pilavachi, I guess, could see the passion, see the potential and recognise maybe a call on me and, and really got alongside me and encouraged me and gave me opportunity to, to begin to lead and really, I guess, helped um, cultivate the gift and the call. Um, so that was very instrumental for leading worship. But then I guess as, along with that, I I guess I got a bit bored of singing everyone else's songs. It's like I wanted to kind of get some of these emotions and feelings out of me to articulate them with word and melody and so began writing songs. And for me, songwriting has always been an incredibly uh, frustrating but also incredibly exhilarating process. And so began to write songs that began to be used at these festivals and summer camps and youth camps and amazingly began to get picked up by other people so so i began writing these songs they're being picked up and amazingly being sung all over the world and and i guess with that doors began to open up and i do a lot with um a guy called matt redman who's also part of our local church community in england obviously matt's written some of the best songs in the church and so it's just this amazing time of creativity and opportunity and great people around to encourage me and, and um, invest in me. So very special memories of a, a beautiful time. How did you start? Um, did you start writing songs just on your own, like solo, or were you doing co-writes? Um, initially, actually, I began writing on my own. I mean, it's funny, that was the kind of the model. Um, so Matt Redman, who was part of Soul Survivor, he, he's writing all of these songs on his own. So that's kind of what I did. Yeah. And wrote, um, well, I started writing a few songs which were, you know, probably important lessons in learning to the craft of songwriting, but they never really got picked up. And then I, I remember I, I'd been working away on this song called Here I Am to Worship, which uh, I was actually finishing off my studies at university, I was doing um, history. And uh, I was writing this song and I remember playing it to Matt. Redmond, and he was like, oh, it's, you know, it's okay. Have you got any other songs? So I took that as code for him to say it was rubbish. And so I kind of, I, I, I sat on it. And then I remember thinking, I'll just, just try at the end of church one day and see what happens. And I remember playing it and it felt like it really connected. And Mike Pilavachi, who's my pastor, came up and said, what is that song? He said, that's amazing. You know, he's like, you're going to be singing that song for years to come. And I was like, what? Um, and the song just kind of just had this explosive life on it. It was amazing, uh, a complete surprise to me. Again, kind of reminded me that sometimes we're not always the best judge of what works, what doesn't. Um, and so I think for me, that was a real thing of gaining confidence yeah. to really give more time to invest in, in songwriting and thinking maybe there is there are more songs that I, I might write that will be a blessing to people. Um, so, yeah. When you think back to that time when you played that song at church and Mike heard yeah. it, yeah. was the song at that time exactly as we know it now, or was it different? Do you remember? Like, was the bridge and yeah. the chorus all exactly the same? It was pretty much, yeah. There was a couple of lyrical tweaks. Yeah. I mean, the, the, the big game changer moment again, and this is uh, when the night sort of played it again to Matt, Redman and he, he initially it was a verse and then the bridge which is the I never know how much it costs section was like a pre-chorus so yeah. verse pre-chorus chorus and Matt was like just it feels too long before you get to the chorus so why don't you have yeah. verse chorus verse chorus and then that section I never know how much it costs becomes the bridge at the end okay yeah because really, it felt like it meant you're singing the song and then you feel like maybe it's coming to an end and you have yeah. a whole other section which deepens this whole theme of it. Basically, here on to worship is the story of Philippians too. you know, Jesus stepping out, you know, stepping from heaven into earth and, you know, being exalted, you know, so that, that was, um, that was a really helpful structural change that I think made the song much better. It's a timeless song. It's one of those songs that just never gets old. <laughs> And maybe that's easy for me to say, like, you're the one that sings it probably every every time you lead worship. Well, well it, it's amazing. Um, you know, wherever wherever I go, the joy of leading. I was, I was just in uh, a couple of weeks back in Nigeria, in Lagos, and they'd worship at this amazing event. Half a million people gathered to worship. Yeah. And 
you start playing this song and everyone knows it and it, it, it's it's a very humbling uh yeah. thing as a songwriter very moving to see something that really connects and i think what what i love about worship songs when they really get into the body of the church they almost they're no longer yours <laughs> yeah <laughs> you know and and um <clears throat> you know it's not like an artist singing their song it's like the you're leading a song that people just worship yeah. you. So that's what that I love is amazing worshiping song worship and and it's in every language now. And so you've been leading yeah. for a long time. Yeah. Right. How have you seen worship change over 20 years? When you, th- when you think back to like when you first started leading, yeah. as we were just talking about your story, like how have you seen it change from then to now? It's a great question. I think, <clears throat> of course, there have been lots of things that are, are, are brilliant. I think we've seen. Yeah. When I started leading, there's a, a real um, awakening, I think, of worship happening in the church i think massive impact and that was john wimber in the vineyard around intimacy and worship and these simple courses <coughs> that as a <coughs> that kind of created a sense of connecting and encountering god i think moving from just singing theology which i think sometimes the church maybe could was in danger of getting stuck in which is also important but actually we believe worship is about encounter um, and so you, you just saw this sort of sense of awakening and all these songs and movements just gathering in, in the, the joy and the delight of worship. What God was doing was incredible. And I think what we've seen is um, people really investing in the gift of creativity, of music. I think the quality of songs now is incredible. Church is placing much higher value on worship and music. Um, I think, you know, all the resources available now are incredible. The training, the, the theological study alongside the practical, you know, resourcing. <clears throat> I, I think that's made a massive difference to so many churches, empowering them and encouraging them. And I've, I've loved seeing that. I've loved seeing the, you know, the different expressions of music and the diversity of that. And, um, just there's so many amazing songs there that can really connect the heart. I, I, I think my one critical challenge would be with the um, up um, scaling of the quality, the danger of that becoming more of an emphasis than the heart. And I think as I look back, some of the quality that we were sort of engaging with was not, you know, wouldn't hold its own now, but there was something so beautiful and naive and raw and passionate about the expression that really engaged people and freedom of the spirit. And I guess my fear is, um it's become almost too professional too slick and i think worship always has to be raw heartfelt it's about you know human frailty encountering the infinite divine creator and that should be an emotional and a beautiful and a mysterious and a sacred thing and if all we're focusing on is, you know, the set and the sound and the production and the lights, we can miss some of those things. And um, so I'd love to see how we engage the excellence with the, the risk and the freedom and the rawness of worship. It's so interesting because I would say I have seen the same thing. I think that I met, when I think back to when I was first started leading, you know, a lot of these songs from that first album, I remember it being very raw. Like we weren't onto a yeah. click. <laughs> And we just yeah. kind of like, we would sing songs for like 10 minutes and flow all over the song. Like, let's do the bridge again and the chorus. Like, we were all over the place. Yeah. And worship really was just raw and just yeah. a full expression of like whatever you're feeling like in the moment. And there was yeah. something very special about that. And I don't feel like we do as well now because we're locked into a, a, a click or a set list. Or even well, a time I, I, limit. <laughs> exactly. Well, I, I, I was in um, Hungary, Budapest, at this big event, and it was so hot. It was like 43 degrees. It was in this big stadium outdoors. And our, my um, the drummer, his tracks and computer basically melted from the heat. I was just about to go into a couple of songs, and, you know, you're sort of like, ah, you know, there's no click, there's no tracks. Can we even lead worship? And, of course, I spent so many years leading without any of that stuff. It's like, of course you can. You just play the songs. And funny, it was really liberating. Just yeah. simple acoustic, singing the songs, and 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 uh, God was working. So I, I do think 
Um, I do think it's important that we we encourage worship leaders, songwriters, just to um, move away from being too fixed on all the all the gadgets and the gizmos, which are amazing, but can be in danger of yeah. limiting the heart expression. I wonder if there's ever going to be a time or a movement where, you know, these new like young like Gen Zers come up and they're like, we're not playing with a click ever. <laughs> like we're not, you're not using tracks anymore. And it kind of gets back to what it was. I wonder if yeah. that'll ever happen. Oh, I, I, I'm sure we'll see. I mean, in the UK, funny enough, a lot of the, um, what's cool now is almost going particularly kind of strip away the lights. You know, that some, some of that's high level production thing can actually, for some young people, I've noticed almost a bit of a turn off. They're kind mm-hmm. of a bit like, uh, you know, I think people like the raw feel. So, but, but, yeah. it, but again, isn't it? I, I think it's for the church and leaders. And I, I now pastor a church in Birmingham, and just recognizing it's the importance of of teaching and discipling people in what worship is. And of course, we know that worship isn't simply about songs. You know, worship is our wholehearted response to God's initiating love. Um, but within that, there's this special thing that we see right throughout Scripture where God's created this gift of music to enable us to connect and to express mysteries too deep for words. And, but but I, I, I think we need more teaching and more training on, on the heart of worship. Again, I, I've been saying to some of our worship leaders, and <clears throat> I think sometimes the danger can be we work so hard on creating these amazing experiences on Sunday you have got to make this the best, exciting, dynamic experience for everyone who gathers, which can be great. But the danger is actually what we need to do is train and educate people. How can they be worshippers so you can strip away the band? You don't have to be at church on a Sunday. You can be throughout the week. But you know what it is to find the language of worship. I think COVID was fascinating for that. The pandemic where certainly in the UK and many places we weren't able to meet in person. And actually you realize, gosh, have we really set up the people of God to know what to do when we can't gather on a Sunday with the nice band and the great songs? Do people know what it means to be a worshipper when they're on their own, they're going through hardship, um, they don't have the sound of the band? So I, I think yeah. there is a lot more that can be done to disciple people in worship. Yeah, that's so good. So give us a glimpse into like, what are you up to these days? Are you on staff at a church, songwriting? Tell us a little bit about yeah. what your world looks like right now. Yeah, so uh, about seven years ago, my wife and I, we moved to Birmingham, not Alabama, Birmingham, UK, which is right in the sort of centre of the UK, and we planted a church. And um, previously, I, I'd been involved as a worship pastor of, well, first at Soul Survivor, and then a church called HTB, which pioneered a big thing called the Alpha Course. Yeah. And out of that, I developed with some friends a thing called Worship Central, where we were training and equipping worship leaders and had a whole bunch of hubs around the world. And... I guess I, I, I love leading worship. I still feel that's my deep passion. But I began to sense this call to actually lead a church where we could do some of the things we're talking about, raise up worshippers, create space for creatives. Um, yeah, hmm. be, be a community of worshippers. And so over the last seven years, we've been leading that church. Um, it's been an amazing adventure, challenging. It's a different thing, leading people rather than just leading worship. Um, yeah. We've seen people do some wonderful things. People come to faith, reaching out, serving the city. And as part of that, we've um, been encouraging songwriters. We, we, um, we've been releasing music under our church name, so it's Gas Street Music. And, yeah, really loving some of the songs coming through. I mean, w- w- one of the big journeys we've been on is Birmingham is um, demographically one of the youngest cities in Europe, and it's one of the most diverse cities in Europe. And so our church is growing to be much more diverse in its makeup. And so what does that diversity mean for the sound of our songs and the sound of our music and who's invited into the heart to write and create and where we embrace difference? And so I, I, think that's, I found that really exciting that the songs are sounding different from what perhaps I naturally write on my own in my room and um, bringing in you know, friends who've grown up in Birmingham but have sort of Zimbabwe family. And uh, it, it, <coughs> we have a, um, a large Farsi community, refugees from Iran. And 
<clears throat> you know, we just released a song that was in English and Farsi. And, and so I think that's been amazing to see. I'm sure that will be um, more and more something we see in the church in the future, understanding we're, we're a global community and many of our cities are made up of many different languages and tribes and people. And that's yeah. ultimately the expression of worship in heaven will be. So um, that that's kind of been what I, I've been doing and uh, spending a lot of my time on. So you're, would you say, like, are you a senior pastor now? Yeah. So would you yeah. say that most of your time is now towards like the pastor side and less on worship side, or is it about 50, 50 or. Well, the funny thing is I, I feel like um, <clears throat> I'm still a worship pastor, but I lead the worship a bit less through my guitar, but more through um, yeah. teaching, creating environments yeah. where people uh, understand what it means to respond to God by spirit in our, in our services and gatherings. Um, I, I still, I mean, I still do lead a bit, still write. And so I think that's a massive part of who I am and how I lead. But yeah, a, a lot of more teaching, more leading and visioning. Um, so it's, it's a, it's a different skill set, but I, I think if I look at, um, I think some of the, the, the people have released so much worship around the world. You know, John Wimber, he was a worship leader um, at Vineyard and created and, and, and empowered and released so many amazing songwriters and worship. Bill Johnson at Bethel, to say the same, this guy, Mike Pilavachi, that yeah. was his passion, worship. So uh, I think that's a lot of what I'm doing now, trying to really encourage and train and release others Maybe wow. you'll see and lead a bit more, but um, they need people to create space for them to, to step out. I am that's amazing. I imagine that would that would have been a challenging transition <laughs> to go yeah. from doing music all the time to then now, you know, studying and preparing sermons and. But I mean, you kind of studied under the best. That's for sure. Uh, yeah, you know? no, yeah, ha- ha- has been hard. I mean, what what's so much hard is you you get very familiar. And, confident in an area of ministry yeah. and then you, you you step into something where you feel very fragile and vulnerable in yeah, yeah. but those i i, I think you whatever you, exactly whatever you do in life the moment you feel you've got this down is a very dangerous place to be yeah. in you always need to put yourself in environments where you feel terrified <laughs> yeah what so what does a typical day look like for you right now um, I mean, it varies. I mean, we've also got five kids, so wow. that will uh, that will uh, shape the day somewhat. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, I mean, it, it, you know, Tuesdays would be lots of meetings, figuring everything. I mean, we, we've so with the church, it's grown fast. We've planted church. We've planted, I think, five churches. We have we're well, one church over three locations. So logistically and organisationally, now it's fairly complex. Um, Wednesdays, I'll always try and keep it as a creative day song write, get some space. Thursdays, again, would be meetings. Um, Friday's probably more preparation. Saturdays yeah. would be off. And then Sundays is full busy day at church. Um, when do you make time to write? How do you make, when do you make time to write music? Well, Wednesday would probably be the main day. Yeah. The, the other thing I'm learning is from um, other friends who are sort of creative pastors is, Sometimes kind of try and fit it all neatly into one week period. It's, it's just impossible. But actually to look at seasons. And so I'll try and take, you know, so back in July, I took a few weeks off where ducked out of all meetings, handed a bunch of responsibility on to others and just created space for reading and writing and thinking and reflecting. And I yeah. think probably for me, that will be a, that's the best way of doing it, creating a week here, a few days there. To, to do that because what, what you're doing and I think this has been my great challenge is you're moving from being very much in the granular you know budget meetings and staffing and structures and it's, it's a different side of the brain to suddenly switching off to uh, spacious yeah. and and the whole thing of creativity and art is it's a waste <laughs> art is you know is is it is it necessary is it needed is it functional but we all know for human beings, a great song, a great piece of art, a great movie can be 
life changing. You really can. And and so yeah. you, you need to also switch mindset to I might spend a whole day working on a song and it may never, ever see the light of day. And that, that's quite different. Or, or even just getting in touch with your emotions and, and, and songwriting. It can't purely be from the head. It's got to be from the heart, from the guts. Yeah. And so yeah. I find for me, I need a few days to almost decompress, to get in tune with me, <laughs> um, to allow some of that stuff to come out rather than just suddenly rushing from a staff meeting to write, let's write for a few hours. That, that, I don't think that gets the best out of me. Well, and you just quit, you said that it can be life changing, and yeah. a realization I had recently was that it could be life changing even if it's just for you. Like, yeah. I I recently started picking up songwriting again, um, mm. and really, what I found when I was done, and I actually recorded a project that I haven't released yet at all. But I thought, you know what, this process was really more just for me. Like, it's it, it probably no one's probably ever going to hear it, or like maybe these songs are never going to be sung in churches. They probably won't. But like, if it was life changing for anybody, it was really for like me and my relationship with God, and yeah. that has value to it. Like, even if you just do it just for you and God. No, so I've just been, just been listening to uh, Bono's written his autobiography, um, I think called Surrender or something, full songs. And but what struck me is how much artistic space he, you know, so he paints, he'll read poetry, he'll. All of these different outlets, which are ultimately enabling him to express himself, which then, I guess, the the uh, icing on the cake of these songs, which end up being on a U2 album. Yeah. And it just, it just struck me again, uh, all of us in different ways are wired, but that if you've got a creative wiring, if you want to flourish and do well in life, you've got to create space for that. Otherwise, right. something new is being suppressed and denied and sometimes it can be so hard just to get started like doing it yeah. you know it's kind of like when you know you need to be doing something but it's just like you do everything <laughs> other than that yeah. but then you get started and you're like wow this brings me a lot of life yeah and also we're, we're trained around this whole thing about productivity that you know we're going to maximize the most life squeeze everything out of it like high impact you know and so you feel like is spending a day on this, which might lead to nothing worth it, when I could bash out a bunch of emails and a bunch of meetings where I'll know and I can see the product of impact. So you've got to jump into the unknown and be comfortable in who knows what will happen here, but yep. value it regardless of the outcome. Wow, that's good. All right, Tim, I've got two, two other questions for you. Yeah. As generous as you were with sitting down with me, you know, about 20 years ago over lunch as yeah. a young worship leader. So if you were sitting down now with a young worship leader who's like 16 years old, just yeah. getting started and leading worship, really passionate about it, wants to do this like with their life, yeah. and they're asking you for advice, what would you what would you say? Like what would you tell a young, young worship leader? Well, one of my favorite quotes around leading worship which was a guy you probably know Andy Park yeah Vineyard worship leader. <clears throat> he said leading worship is taking your private cry and making it public hmm. and I I, th I still it's so simple and everyone sort of nods their heads and say yes but very few actually do that and I, and I think the um, <clears throat> a worship leader needs to be a worshiper and again back to some of those things where if the danger is you're learning all your skills from YouTube or watching what Hillsong do or Bethel or Elevation yeah. or whoever it is, and you imitate, you can probably get away with leading worship well in a church and people enjoying it and appreciating it. But if you really want to lead people into life-changing encounters with the Spirit of God, you need to be a worshipper. And, and, and the more time you spend and you carve out on your own before God, wrestling with him, loving him, um, connecting and, you know, conversing with him, communing with him. When you step out to lead, you won't just be delivering songs and great sets. I think you'll be someone who can usher in the spirit of God. And, mm. and for me, uh, worship is a spiritual activity. Again, you know, I think a lot of what we see in our churches is, is good, solid worship. But what the church, I believe, needs is spirit-led worship, where, wow. you know, 
it says in Philippians 3 verse 3, we who worship by the Spirit of God, it's only when the Spirit opens our eyes to understand the beauty of Jesus and the love of the Father that people really begin to change and wow. be transformed. And so if you want to be really effective in a kingdom way, then it's, it's not going to happen purely by learning and working with your skills, although that is important. It's going to be you allowing Christ into the very depths of your heart and learning what it means to be a, a worshipper and fighting for that. Um, so that would be a, probably the main thing I'd say. And then the other thing is, <clears throat> I think one of the most important things is finding your voice. And that, that takes time. That's taken me a long time, I think, to find my voice not to imitate someone else's voice to, to understand how is god wired and created me that's going to be very different from a matt redman or a chris tomlin or yeah. whoever it is um and, and i think um just yeah learning and understanding who you are and being com- comfortable to bring that is massive i think of david uh, king david before he's about to confront Goliath you know Saul was going to put his armor on him which in the eyes of the world would make most sense the best army he could have to face this giant but David was like that's not me he, he goes out with you know slingshot and five smooth stones and it just looks bonkers in the eyes of the world but that was where God's anointing um, met him and carried him and so I, I, I think learning to find your voice what's distinct about your wiring that makes you special um and then probably to do that you need other people to help you discover it and you need to grow and being self-aware that's good i was thinking too it's so funny in the early 2000s like when it was the british invasion basically of all these like british worship leaders you tim hughes matt redman martin smith i remember there was like an era there where all these like young worship leaders like myself i'm totally guilty of this we're singing like with a british accent (laughs) Yeah. <laughs> I'm like a kid from Indiana singing with a British <laughs> accent. Yeah. And it's, but, and I, and sometimes I listen back to some of those like old recordings of like when I was leading worship and I'm like, man, I wish that I, I really wish someone around me would have been telling me that. Like, yeah, what are you yeah. doing? Like find your, like, yeah. where, are you, where are you mimicking someone? Like yeah. use the voice that God gave you. Like, yeah. and I don't know, you know, it's just, I think that's a good word. I think that's a very good word. Um, so, all right. My last question, this is a very light one. Yeah. What's your favorite worship song or album right now that's just really stirring you? And it doesn't have to be new. It could even be old. Like for me right now, it's like this song that's really connecting with me that almost just brings like tears to my eyes when I'm listening to it is Made Me Glad by Hillsong from like 20 years ago. It's so old. Yeah. yeah. But it's just when I hear it, I'm like, oh my gosh, this song. <laughs> and I keep listening to it. Is there a song right now in your world, like December yeah. of 22, that's like stirring you? <clears throat> yeah, no, I... I um... <clears throat> I'm loving this song by Brandon Lake called Gratitude. You know, I, I just think it's so simple. I love singing worship. Um, <clears throat> Come on my soul, don't you get shy on me. Lift up your voice. You, you know, you got a line inside of your lungs to get up and praise the Lord. I, I love that. Again, you know, the, the preaching to self, to use your voice to worship God. And, you know, uh, yeah, yeah I, I've, I've absolutely uh, loved that song of late. That's so good. Well, Tim, I appreciate you taking the time to hang out and talk. It was good just to catch up again. And yeah, thank you. No, great to catch up. Really good to again. see you Brilliant. again. I love, love what you guys are doing, and it's amazing. As I said, all of these things, it's the joy of all these amazing resources that can really, really help. And it's great to hear your heart as well, that you're obviously a passionate worshiper and uh, longing to see yeah. people encounter God rather than just play great music. Ex- exactly, 100%. I'm a vineyard. My, I'm a vineyard born and bred. Like my dad was a vineyard pastor, grew up in the vineyard church movement in Southern California. And so for me, I like really want people to be able to use these tools, but not make it about the tools Yeah. yeah. and like really have the heart of worship. So I, I appreciate all, everything you've done for worship leaders. So thank you. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Great to chat. Great to connect. Yeah. Good to see you again. All right. Bless you, mate. Talk soon. Yep. Bye. Yeah. Bye. All right, you guys, great conversation with Tim Hughes. That was uh, really great just to be able to talk about um, all those topics. Honestly, we covered a ton of stuff. And so what I would love is if you watch that interview, type down in the comments what's one thing you're, one thing you're going to walk away from that interview with. What's one thought that captured you that you thought was interesting? Type it into the comments now. And if you have not already, make sure you hit the subscribe button so that you can stay tuned for other Loop Live events. Thanks for being a part of Loop Community and hope you have a great week. 
is Matt. Thanks for listening. Hey, let us know what's the main thing you learned from today's talk. Write it down in the comments. Send us a DM. We hope to hear from you soon. Thank you.